Welcome to the Motor Carriage Insurance Education Foundation monthly truck stop webinars. These truck stops are presented for the second Thursday of each month at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. These webinars are presented as industry updates for information purposes only and do not qualify for state CE credit. If you're seeking state CE credit, we do do webinars that qualify for that. You need to contact our office at trs at ibci.net or call us and talk to Beth, and we will send you information for these opportunities for state CE. I've asked Bridget Blitch, uh, who has just started her new law firm, to come with us and uh, discuss this, this accident uh, uh, qualification or accident, the new definition of accident preventable determination program that they, uh, the FMCSA started uh, last August. Uh, Bridget, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Tommy. Glad to Gr be here. Great picture of you. And this is your new office location, right? And information, right? <laughs> yes, this is, uh, I, I'm pleased to announce that we have a national law firm with two office locations. Uh, one here in Windermere, Florida, and another in Madison, Wisconsin. Great. And for you who uh, have been with Bridget, you know she has helped us a lot getting officers or not. And one of the things we're going to do at the annual conference uh, in October is Bridget's going to have an officer and do actually a mock full compliance review what the officer goes through as he goes through all the details in the uh, motor carrier's offices and ends up with a rating at the end. And if that rating is not what we want, she'll talk about how to uh, challenge some of those kind of things. So we look forward not only to this webinar with you, Bridget, but uh, the one at the conference and also everything else you do for us. Now, this next picture, I understand, is somebody you found in the woods somewhere? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he's trouble, right? And uh, no, I, that is my dear sweet husband, uh, Joseph Joel. He goes by Joel Blitch. Uh, and I am just thrilled uh, to partner with him as well as my other partner, Richard Wesley. My husband is a 24-year litigator, uh, and he comes with extensive experience uh, practicing labor and employment law, and then also brings uh, to the firm his trial advocacy skills. So uh, such an asset of, you know, to me personally, but to, to the firm and to our clients as well. And my other partner, who I don't have a picture of yet, um, but also just a treasure to the transportation community, is Richard Wesley. He is a 42-year transportation law attorney. Uh, he is based in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, our uh, our practices, as we had discussed, are just extremely aligned in terms of all the services we offer uh, to our clients, to motor carriers, brokers, uh, shippers uh, and everyone basically in the supply chain. So we're really excited to have uh, Richard Wesley on board and his years of experience. So uh, we're a great team, thrilled to be practicing with my best friends and uh, look forward to an exciting future together uh, serving the community at Blitch Wesley. Well, Bridget, you've always offered a lot to us in your old position, and I'm sure this new position uh, will also uh, be beneficial to our members and uh, reach out to you. And we always appreciate you responding to them and, and doing what uh, they need done. Uh, anyway, let's get through this kind of stuff. We're going to talk about now uh, to, to be or not to be uh, uh, dimension with the FMCSA crash uh preventability program. And again, this is who's presenting this program today with Bridget. And I want to talk just a few minutes how it fits in the insurance industry, Bridget, then we'll turn it over to you. As you hope for most of you know, the DOT requires a crash report. That's a report that the DOT officer does, and the insured also must do the paperwork in their office when these crashes happen. For all holders of the DOT number, uh, when a crash happens with the following characteristics, if somebody gets killed, a fatality, dies at the site of the accident, not later, at the site of the accident, that's the DOT recordable. Someone who's injured, someone has to be removed from the crash site to the medical, for medical treatment away from the crash site. Again, most of those, they would, might die later, but it's not shown a fatality until they actually die later, but the injury. And towed, where one or more of the vehicles could had to be towed away from the crash site. 
So the determination made by the officer at the crash site depends on what they see at the crash site. Was somebody die? Did somebody die in the crash? Did somebody uh, get injured in a crash? And then some, the, some of the vehicles have to be towed away. That's the three classification that the FMCSA uses for crashes. Crash happens and is recorded. Information available on the federal website. Again, crash, uh, they also factor in the crash basis in the CSA report. And if the threshold exceeds, meaning too many crashes based on their peer group, then the intervention starts. As we know, that's the letters, that's the alert, and that's kind of stuff. Uh, these reports for the crashes uh, don't show causation at this point. There's no uh, delineation for causation. It doesn't say who's at fault or not, just that somewhere the your insurance or our insurance motor carrier's DOT number gets involved in the crash. Uh, and they could just, as later we'll talk about when Bridget goes through what can be challenged or not, some of these things the, insure, the uh, motor carrier, the insured, has nothing to do with, but they still could get written up. Uh, one of the examples I use, our friend uh, uh, Scopolitis, uh, Gary Fleury, talks about his driver sleeping in a hotel room when the crash, his tr truck was legally parked and someone ran off the highway ran in the back of him died and his motor carrier was challenged with that and by the way also had to be do a drug test uh, even though they were asleep so this is how we talk about it. there's no causation but it's a it's a it just shows up in the crash uh, data and the fmcsa website which we use for safer and the csa scores the trucking industry the american truck association the truck load carrier association have said this is not right if the motor carriers do nothing to cause the crash and was just at the wrong place at the wrong time, the crash should not be reflected on the public website. The scores, are, and so this is the move they had. So part of this is why the scores were taken down with the uh, Fast Act uh, Fixing American Transportation System back in December of 2013. However, as you, we might know, or you might know, Central Analysis Bureau and Carry Software now predicts those crashes because they have the data to do it. And so they can now predict what the crash basic score will be, or at least their interpretation of the basic score, which is very close to the basic scores that the FMCSA has. So even though we didn't previously see them, we do have as an underwriting tool or, as a, or as a mechanism uh, for determining uh, uh, our writing a risk or not, we can look at those scores. The center says reviews these crashes and sees if they are ref reflected on loss information. Some are shown on the federal web stage, but not on loss information because some are when, uh, it's because when it's on the loss information, it's when payment is made. So some of them will have a crash. I ensure it's at fault. We make a payment. It'll be shown on both. Some are not shown in our loss run. Those are the ones where the insurer did not cause the crash. There was no claim, nothing was paid. Only thing shown on loss runs after you determine uh, a period of time and nothing's paid over a period of time, they're taken down. And so we don't see those. This is gonna be some crashes on the loss runs that are not on the CSA scores. This is where the car can be fixed after the crash. They can drive off after the crash or someone hurts and has a whiplash later. So when we compare our loss information, we got to realize that those are based on our insured having a claim made against them post when a crash happens. The FMSA website just is when something happens. So we have a, a combination where some are gonna be shown on both, some are gonna be shown only on loss runs and not on FMCSA scores, and some are gonna be shown FMCSA scores that are not shown on our loss runs. When that happens, most of the insurance carriers want some detail about that to make sure clearly that there wasn't something uh, that might come back later to haunt them or to have a problem later. So that, that's a very brief overview in that area. Uh, the FMCSA conducted a study a number of years ago and found it was not worth the cost to delineate between at fault or not at fault, and so and only affect the small motor, uh, small number of motor carriers. Well, this has been revisited. So, on August 1st, 2017, the FMCSA started a new study. Again, it's a study, and Bridget will explain more about what happened in the study. When a crash happens, motor carrier can challenge that it was not an FMCSA reportable crash, meaning they were not at fault. Therefore, it would not be shown there. I guess the term at fault is wrong here, Bridget. You're going to have to clarify that when we have a minute. So with that introduction, I'm going to give it to you, my dear. Take over. <laughs> well, Tommy, thank you so much. I think that was a, 
great uh, foundation to set the stage on what we're going to be talking about here this morning and really kind of what prompted my interest in educating the industry about the crash demonstration preventability program is one of just because that program is there does that mean that we or our clients or our insured should be taking care taking action and participating in that program and so in order to make an educated decision as to whether this will benefit our clients benefit our insureds, we really need to know what is this program about. So uh, as Tommy indicated, you know, since the implementation in 2010, the safety management system has used safety performance information in what we all know is the behavioral analysis safety improvement categories or your basic categories, plus recordable crashes involving commercial motor vehicles that are submitted to the states through the agency's motor carrier management information system. And this is to prioritize carriers for safety interventions. So what we want to address here is that if there has been a crash that has re been reported and this information has been taken into this MCMS IS system, this potentially could increase the likelihood of the motor carriers being subject to an intervention. And Tommy, as we've talked about, these systems that the FMCSA is evaluating is determining, is this motor carrier that is operating in interstate commerce, is it safe? Is there reason to believe that the law enforcement or FMCSA needs to intervene in order to evaluate the safety performance of the carrier that they've authorized to operate in interstate commerce? So the agency uses the definition, as you mentioned, in, uh, Tommy, of accident, identifying those crashes that must be maintained by the motor carrier in an accident register. And like I, you mentioned, these include fatalities, bodily injuries requiring immediate medical treatment away from the scene of the crash, or a vehicle being towed away from the scene because of a disabling damage. These same crashes, again, must be reported to the state to the FMCSA through the MCMIS if the commercial motor vehicle has an actual weight or gross vehicle weight rating of 10,000 or more pounds or gross combination weight rating of 10,000 or one or more pounds and is used on public highways. All right, so all of that to say that we've got a set of standards by which law enforcement will say, if this is a DOT reportable crash, you're operating a commercial motor vehicle, we're gonna use this crash to evaluate your safety rating. And it can be or cause you to be subject to a DOT audit, either a fine or a full compliance audit. So the rationale might be, well, if we're gonna be potentially subject to a DOT audit that could compromise our existing safety rating, whether that's satisfactory or conditional or we're not rated, we want to ensure that we are not going to be subject to such intervention and also that we're doing everything possible uh, to internally prevent our own crashes. Bridget, let me so, stop you. Let me stop here. This is the big part here is that it it, it leads the insured going through the the classification of the inspections program and and having a, a compliance inspection at their office. I was asked by Dan Murray with uh, Atra before the study came out, how is it going to affect insurance? Because they thought it would be a big effect in insurance. And again, I leave it up to the audience to determine this, but basically this doesn't affect insurance because insurance typically goes by loss information. Those are loss runs. And the only time I've seen these, these crashes affecting insurance and the availability of insurance is to show if a crash shows up on the FMCSA and doesn't show up on the uh, loss runs, then they want some more information about it, just determine what those are. And there are a few carriers here who do not require loss runs unless there is an FMCSA crash. But that's really the only effect of insurance because we pay attention to what happens uh, on our loss information when we actually have to pay something out. And a, lot, a number of these crashes, we would not have to pay things out. Now, one of them, like we're going to be talking about not preventable here in a minute, and that's when your insured runs into an animal. It won't show up on liability, but it would clearly show up on physical damage. So there could be some gray areas of both of those two. But the big point here is that if they exceed this threshold, 
they're going to get the intervention process started and the DOT officers are going to pay more attention to them and come visit with them, which could lead to fines and penalties and some kind of rating scores. I just want to clear that up where, where we look at this, Bridget. Right. So, you know, we, we work in a multidimensional world where we've got insurance considerations and then we have government considerations. And this is one where the government has developed this program to say, all right, crash indicator, your basic score, we use crashes from the previous 24 months to calculate a percentile for a motor carrier. And SMS weight crashes based on severity with more weight even give, being given to a fatality and, and injury crashes than those that resulted, for example, in a vehicle being towed away from the scene with no injuries or fatalities. So what we're talking about here is the potential to being subject to a DOT intervention audit and then the consequences of that. Um, so Tommy, I think you bring up a good point because the insured or the clients may think, well, if we go through and we exercise our rights under the crash demonstration preventability program and we are able and we are successful in that program, does that mean that we get a reduction in premium or that underwriters will view us as a more favorable risk. And my point to Dan was probably not. That was the point I was trying to make, Bridget. Here, it's that's mm -hmm. the. It doesn't affect insurance as much as Dan thought, and some of the motor carriers might think. Well, right, and so then the question becomes, what do we do with this crash present preventability program? We know that the um, agency has now developed this program that will allow the FMCSA to per permit certain types of crashes to be reviewed. And we're going to go into that. Um, so knowing the background of how this data is being used and really that it's intended for the FMCSA to measure this data and measure the safety performance, let's consider what effect it has on your insured and our clients in pursuing this program. So the first is, and this is taking, the, and we're going to make the assumption that we're going to go ahead and file a request for data review for a crash. In that case, the crash uh, could not be prevented, and we choose this selection to ensure the crash event date is on or after June 1st, 2017. So that's, we've got parameters in selecting the types of crashes that are subject to review by the FMCSA. So a lot, and we'll go through some statistics, a lot of the crashes that have been submitted occurred prior to June 1st, 2017. And in that case, those determination requests were rejected. So here's what the FMCSA will say is eligible for review. And this is their list that they've developed. And it's the commercial motor vehicle was struck by a motorist driving under the influence of related offense. The commercial motor vehicle was struck by a motorist driving in the wrong direction. The commercial motor vehicle was struck in the rear. And I'm going to get to uh, some caveats on each of these here. The commercial motor vehicle was struck while it was legally stopped or parked, including when the vehicle was unattended. When the commercial motor vehicle is struck an individual committing or attempting to commit suicide by stepping or driving in front of the commercial motor vehicle. When the commercial motor vehicle sustained disabling damage after striking an animal or in the roadway. When the crash was the result of an infrastructure failure, falling trees, rocks, or other debris. When the commercial motor vehicle was struck by cargo equipment from another vehicle. So if you're a motor carrier, and you have a accident, one of the considerations is first, do I at least generally meet one of the categories that's been identified by the FMCSA? And there are a number of filings that have been submitted in which the FMCSA says, no, your crashes don't meet the eligibility requirements. For example, an RDR, and that's a request for data review, asserting the driver who struck the commercial motor vehicle was operating under the influence without any supporting evidence or documents showing testing, results, citation, or arrest. 
And so we're going to get to this, but what these RDR submissions are asking for is documentation to support that one of the crashes that you're trying to challenge meets one of the selected lists that the FMCSA will consider. Another is the RDR submitted for crashes identified as struck by a motorist in the wrong direction, where the vehicle that was struck, the commercial motor vehicle, is not operating completely in the wrong lane or in the wrong direction. So basically what this is saying is that there could be instances where you may have been struck in the wrong direction, but these crashes do not include where the vehicle that struck the commercial motor vehicle swerved across the center lane but not travel entirely in the wrong lane or in the, in the wrong direction. So what we think becomes a relatively clear delineation of you were struck because it was going in the wrong direction now becomes clouded. And when we start getting into issues where in a civil context, the liability of the motor carrier is questioned, we need to proceed with caution because the information that we are submitting to the FMCSA through this crash demonstration preventability program has been subject to requests for disclosures and if I were a plaintiff's lawyer, I would be going into this system and getting access to that information. So we need to be very careful about what is submitted when the uh, when we believe we have a crash that may fall into one of these criteria. Um, for these are just some other examples where the crash of the commercial motor vehicle struck in other places on the vehicle, but not near the rear. Uh, where, for example, the commercial motor vehicle was struck on the side or near the rear of the vehicle or on other places of the vehicle. So that seems to think, well, it was diagonal to the back of a truck. Does that mean that it's not subject to a potential qualification for an RDR determination? According to the FMCSA, where the crash occurred at the 7 o'clock and 5 o'clock positions of the truck, no. Now, the question becomes, well, how do you know exactly whether the FMCSA will reject this uh, RDR or not? There may be other circumstances that warrant the FMCSA's review. And in that case, and we're going to get to this, we need to understand exactly what happened in this accident before we start submitting requests for data review to the FMCSA. I know a lot of my clients and a lot of the insurers do have individual departments set up within their companies to address data queue challenges. And now that we have the crash demonstration preventability program, there's people internally that are preparing these RDRs. So I would task the, the, our listeners, for those of you out there that know that your, your insurers, your clients, do have a process where they set up RDRs. Are their personnel trained in submitting specifically information when it, when it relates to a crash preventability demonstration program? And hold that thought because what they're submitting when they do an RDR could have a potential impact even though a lawsuit may not have been filed at the time that the RDR is submitted. So I'm gonna circle back to that, Tommy. So what you're really saying is that anything we send, anything our insured send to the government concerning this later could be asked to be produced at, at, at a claim time. And depending on how they submitted it or what they said, might or might not increase their potential uh, exposure from a, uh, from a, for a liability. Yes, that's exactly right, Tommy. So we're going to get to that here a little bit later into right. the presentation, but I right. wanted to kind of forecast that. Absolutely. So, and it bears, it's going to bear repeating here. So, um, but uh, it, it's worth it because I want to make sure that we have a plan in place and that your audience knows how to approach uh, their clients, their insureds uh, when addressing this crash demonstration preventability program. And, and um, that's so these are. Well, I'm just going to, for people who are listening to this, uh, one of the things you need to factor in as Bridget goes through this is exactly that. The insured might call you up 
and say, I wasn't a fault. I'm going to do this. How will it affect my insurance? That's what you need to, that's when we will become involved in this program. So what we have done so far, telling you how it affects the losses and what the downside could be that Bridget's is going through here is things that you need to be knowledgeable enough when you get that question from your insured, should I, or I am going to uh, challenge that that crash and and then the consequences that might happen and of course their concern at this point in time and that's the you know there's two concerns of this Bridget the first concern is my scores I want to keep those scores down but those scores aren't public anymore so there's a bad part of that the second part of this so I don't have an intervention process but the third one's always hanging out there well does it affect my insurance and so this is where the first dollars come in does it affect my insurance and this is why we wanted to bring this program to you to go through this process. Bridget, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but go ahead and talk to me. No, and that's, I, I think that, that's great insight to uh, bring to the audience. Um, and, and the theme here is we're looking at filings that were not to be. Um, that you'll notice, for example, RDR is alleging a suicide attempt without supporting evidence. So the FMCSA is saying, and I'll get to the next slide here, um, let me go through this real quick. Here's a couple others where the commercial motor vehicle struck other vehicles, stopped for a fallen tree, but this, this commercial motor vehicle did actually not strike that tree or object. Um, or the commercial motor vehicle was struck by cargo equipment, but the documentation establishes that the commercial motor vehicle was actually hit by another vehicle. So the theme there in these lists that they're asking for, you'll notice, they're asking for information. They're asking for supporting documentation. So now we're giving free discovery to a potential plaintiff's lawyer that comes around. And it, there may not be a plaintiff's lawyer involved right immediately after the accident or even months after the accident. So think about while the FMCSA is saying documentation, documentation, what documentation are we going to be providing that could potentially be privileged information? So, and, and I'm going to get to that in a little bit, but Tommy, like you were saying, we need to be careful and our insurers and our clients need to be aware that information that they may be submitting could have a negative consequence down the road. That I, I, I just, and, and as you went through this and you just summarized it well here, also my thought process is a dollar sign there. It's going to take somebody time to deal with this, with this determination. And two things are going to happen with this termination. First off, it's going to cost somebody some time to develop all that information, send it. Second, by the time you can completely document it, you, then you're beyond the basic scores that have a different rating as it goes over two years. I could see where a couple of these things like suicide or, 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 or the DWI to actually get the information from the passenger in another vehicle, not what the officer said at the site, but did they adjudicate them DWI or not might take three or four or five months and follow that up at that point in time. Sometimes in the basic scores, it would not really affect those things. And lastly, it doesn't affect their insurance. So you, they got to talk about, well, how much is going to cost me to get all this information? And then to what benefit does it have if I get it? And so that's what I hope we also walk away from. Again, because you sitting and hearing this, you're going to be asked this question from your insured. Is it worth my while? I need to do this. I, I had it, so I want to take it down. So that's where you need to fact, help them factor these things in. Let's go ahead and talk about those consequences then, Bridget. Yeah. All right. So um, let's look at some of these statistics. Now, these are uh, statistics that were posted on the FMCSA's website regarding their demonstration uh, program. And this is, and I, I, you know, I won't go through each one of these, but this is just to give an idea of how many motor carriers are actually out there submitting RDRs. Uh, and you'll see it's a substantial number of them. Now, here's just some information that was collected by the FMCSA um, where there was a determination made by the RDR and number of RDRs completed, for example, 23 uh, determinations preventable in this category here, not preventable, 1,657. And what's the consequence of that, Tommy? If we've got hey, now we've got a determination by the FMCSA um, that it was not preventable 
can we then use that in court to our benefit um, versus what about those that were deemed preventable? And I'm going to get into that in a little bit later in our presentation. But these are just some of the numbers that I wanted to share with the audience. Bridget, let me let me suggest one other thing. Also, I'm sure we'll have some claims people listen to this thing, and agents might not understand this. This is not just what's permitted in court, but we're talking about mediation now. And so if we have this as part of the mediation, the insurance carriers have to determine at that point in time, how is it going to affect us if it ever gets in court? where it's mm -hmm. admissible or not. So this is another thing going back to the alligator, to the reptile theory of, of attorneys, which is a whole different subject for a different day. But they bring this kind of stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So uh, I'm sure that there are some in our, our audience who participate in pre-suit mediation programs where the insurance company tries to engage early on before a lot of dollars are spent in the defense of the catastrophic claim to come to the table and see if we can get the case resolved before um, it, can, it goes to court and, of course, ultimately to the judge or jury. And this information, you know, plaintiff's lawyers, they know it's out there. They're getting access to it. They're requesting information both in discovery from defense counsel and through FOIA requests. So it's very likely that the insurance companies are going to be seen if they haven't already this information being put in front of them at the mediation table. Now, you know, your defense counsel will push back and for the reasons that I'm going to go in here to, uh, in a few minutes, say, look, this, that information is not admissible. Uh, we're not going to give it any weight or consideration in coming to the table for various reasons. But it is something that, of course, your your defense counsel that's assigned to represent your insurers and your clients needs to be aware of and be ready to to confront uh, that information that they're probably going to get. So here's some information, just some more statistics as to RDR is not eligible for crash preventability demonstration program. So if you, you know, there's probably those motor carriers that say, well, we're just going to go ahead and data queue it anyway, if, even if it was not after June 1st, 2017. And the FMCSA, which by the way, these determinations, they're not going back to the state analysts. In, an, um, in a typical situation where you have uh, requests for data review being submitted where a uh, traffic uh, infraction incurred or a commercial motor vehicle examination report uh, identified uh, maintenance issues or qualification of drivers issues. Uh, in a normal RDR, the information in that request goes back to the state. Here, there, this is actually a unique program uh, because it's going back to the FMCSA and the FMCSA are uh, just really following the federal register guidelines uh, for this program. So if you're insured uh, or cl client comes to you and say, well, yeah, but I don't really think that it falls within this program. I'm just going to go ahead and submit it anyway because I don't think it'll hurt anything. Well, now you're just giving more information without even a potential likelihood of success on a determination program. So again, this is one of those things where I would say, even if you think, ah, this won't hurt me, I'll go ahead and do it anyway. Mm, no, nope. the information that you're putting out to the public could come back to hurt you. So um, here we have the burden of proof. So like I said, the, this is the FMCSA's program. And they're coming and they're telling the industry you, the submitter, the filer of the RDR, have to show by compelling evidence, that's your standard, that the crash was not preventable and that the submitter should submit all evidence in support of the preventability determination. And then the, you know, open the, you know, the, the door, Pandora's box, that all the information of, that can be received. They'll consider all relevant evidence. Um, and so what happens then is that you have maybe an unsophisticated filer going into the system and potentially producing privileged information um, that in the courtroom uh, a plaintiff's lawyer could be filing a motion to compel 
but now doesn't have to worry about filing that motion to compel to submit a DOT accident register or a policy on a DOT uh, preventability, internal preventability program. They can just go to the FMCSA and access this information right here. So Bridget, that's why I say. There's one point here that they miss in this, not preventable, but had to be caused by one of those 10 reasons. I mean, because there's a lot of crashes you say that are they're not preventable, like the the the, the prime class vehicle. We talk about this in drive cam all the time, or the event recorder. The car swears in front of you. That was not preventable, but that's not one of the ones that could be challenged. So the thing they missed here, not preventable, but caused by one. But the factors were one of those ten factors we talked about earlier. That's where they're missing this. <laughs> mm hmm Right. So um, the. <laughs> they're talking about preventability, number one. They're not talking about liability. And we're talking about preventability in a very rigid construct right, right. that the FMCSA has outlined. So burden of proof. So this is a situation where we, as a, as a filer, now I'm an attorney. I can go in as counsel of record and I can submit an RDR. Or you can set up a, an internal profile with your companies and people in-house can be filing these RDRs. And without the proper counsel and guidance as to what documentation should be submitted, assuming, Tommy, like you said, we fall within one of the categories of preventability, we need to be very careful about what information it is that we're gonna be submitting. And so, you know, here's what the, uh, the FMCSA says. Um, motor carriers or drivers must <laughs> this is must submit compelling information and then it goes on to list suggested documents so we've got crash reports police accident reports insurance documents videos or photos media reports affidavits or transcripts okay so some of these and we're going to get into may be covered by an accident report privilege so now they're presenting information that in the context of litigation would not otherwise be discoverable. Affidavits. Okay, Tommy, that's got to make you a little nervous, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we internally uh, saying? And, and, I, and I've seen this, you know, with all the best of intentions at heart, where clients are presenting affidavits from drivers or affidavits from their safety departments. But those affidavits, once they make that statement and they've locked themselves into that statement, can be used against them in later proceedings. So just because the FMCSA, he says you must, submit this compelling evidence and then goes on to list what potential evidence it is that should be submitted doesn't mean that you do that. So the other consequence, all right, when a filer submits a request for data review, they are verifying the truth and accuracy of the statement that's being submitted. So this is a very serious representation that's being made to the United States government. And again, this is one that really warrants our clients, our insurers to understand what information is being submitted. Now, fortunately, it does say intentionally false or misleading. So if you're negligent in your misrepresentation, then you're, you're, yeah, that would be your defense. Well, it was not that you had intended to induce or mislead the United States government. But if there is an evidence to support that somebody internally, without the direction or knowledge of an officer or somebody with authorization of the company to file an RDR, goes and submits some information, this has teeth. This has not only fines, but it has the possibility of imprisonment for up to five years. So I say that, you know, I mean, to, to you know, not to scare, but yes, also to kind of scare people to say, you know, this program's out there, but we need to know, do we have internal controls in place? 
Do our clients have internal controls in place to make sure that people are doing what they are supposed to be doing? And do we have a policy in place, an internal policy with um, a basically chain of command so that if something were to happen, we could go back and say, no, we had a protocol in place. We had a person assigned to submit these RDRs. They were designated with authorization and that this is not just we are more of a freelance operation and whoever happens to be at the controls of the RDR can submit it um, without consultation or direction from an officer or someone with authority of the company. So what's the impact on the court proceedings here? Now we're going to get into the good stuff. All right, we've got potentially a driver submitting an RDR or a company submitting an RDR and they're representing the information is true and correct. Now, my recommendation here is that for those companies, those insureds that are submitting requests for data review, particularly as it relates to this crash demonstration preventability program, is to take a minute and say, all right, this is a crash that just happened. We've reported it to our insurance company. Has our insurance company assigned adjuster to this boss? Do we have the claim number? Do we have their contact information? Let's go ahead and get in contact with our adjuster to advise them of the situation. Now, particularly if we've got an in issue where we have an accident where a potential plaintiff is involved, and it's not just a property damage claim, then all the more reason why we want to get a hold of our adjuster and advise them what we're about to do in submitting this RDR. Because if we don't and we submit this information and it comes down the line months or years later when the case goes to trial and the plaintiff lawyer pulls out the information from the RDR and uses it to cross-examine the driver or cross-examine the safety director that submitted the RDR and impeach them on the witness stand. So you may not be thinking about that when you submit the RDR, but it's something to, to give consideration to. Bridget, I, I don't want to, I, I, I know we got some time limitations, but the other thing you might realize is that the reason the driver does it, it, fa it falls under his pre-employment screening program. So if they see that later, but the motor carrier needs to know if the driver's filing one on their own. Potential owner operators might do that on their own that come back and haunt them. So there should be some coordination between the motor carrier and the driver about submitting these things also. That's exactly right, Tommy. So when you have, uh, and let's talk about this in two different contexts here. Um, one is where you have employee drivers. So with employee drivers, it's going to be a little bit easier because we can control our employee drivers. And we can say um, under our DOT manual, before you submit a request for data review, you need to contact us and you need to advise us. And we need to be able to review the request for data review because the information you're submitting could have an impact on any future litigation. Now, on the other end, Tommy, you know where I'm going with this. Right when we have independent contractor drivers. All right, independent contractors control the means and methods, routes, and all facets, the, their operations, except as required by the customer um, in delivering the shipment. So any control that we exert over the independent contractor driver can be used against our insurers or our clients to erode the independent contractor relationship and attempt to build an employee, uh, employer employee relationship. So in those instances, we need to be careful and ensure that our motor carriers have the right language in their independent contractor agreements that basically say that when there is an accident that they will cooperate, right? Because number one, as the motor carrier, the motor carrier is responsible for maintaining the auto liability uh, coverage. And so uh, we need to ensure that in handling that claims process that we get the cooperation, not as a matter of control, but as a matter of regulation pursuant to the 
to the truth and leasing regulations, as well as the minimum financial responsibility requirements. So we're couching that um, basically oversight, not as we're overseeing operations, but as part of the regulatory requirements for DOT purposes. So let's move on to um, the reviewers here. Um, we've got an individual that gets the request for data review who is not a judge, or at least that, that they're not um, holding themselves out as a judge in a, in a courtroom, but we're dealing with someone who's been trained uh, to review traffic accidents and infractions. And we are looking at a two-step process with the FMCSA in going through this determination. And your initial reviewer is going to be going over the documentation that's submitted. And then the second tier of review will be basically checking the first level of review before final determination is sent out. Now, if you fail, in the first response, you can submit a second request for data review. But that second request has to be, has to include additional information beyond what was originally supported. Oh, and by the way, the FMCSA says, if you submit information without any supporting documentation, we're just gonna close it. So unlike, I know in other states, um, Florida, for example, is one of the states that will actually undertake an investigation of an RDR even if you don't submit any information. They will go back, they'll talk to the officer that issued the citation, they'll get some information as to why the violation was assessed, and they'll come back with a formal responses or determination as to what they're, why they are asserting their findings. You're not going to get that here with the FMCSA. So if you do, while you do have that separate second opportunity to review, it is based on actually information not submitted. Okay, here. Now, <laughs> the FMCSA allows any member of the public with documentation or data to refuse a proposed determination. And that's 30 days to submit that documentation through the data queue portal. So what do you expect is gonna happen? It's just like when you go to traffic court, right? And you've got a tra you've got a driver who's got a traffic citation, and the traffic citation shows property damage only, not bodily injury. But yet, the person that was involved in the accident gets a subpoena, goes to the court, and shows up with their plaintiff's lawyer to contest. Oh no, this was in fact a bodily injury claim, and I was severely injured, and they put on their show. So this is the same concept here, and it's unfortunate that the FSBSA has opened the doors um, because I would say that these plaintiff lawyers are going to be doing the same thing, that they're going to be adding in their two cents through this input from public um, opportunity here. And to be aware even further, I'm sorry to be the bearer of such bad news, but the agency will maintain a list of not preventable determinations, which is updated on its website. So as if it's really saying, please, we, we, we determined it's not preventable, but if you have any other information, please do let us know. Um, at any time during this demonstration program, the documentation, FMCSA, will accept that information. So they say 30 days, yeah, but, but not really 30 days. As long as the program is going, we'll accept that additional information. So going back, Tommy, all the more like we've been saying, just because you have the opportunity doesn't mean that you open the door. Or it's worth your while, <laughs> dollar-wise. That's the other part. Yes. So now if you go through this process and you say, well, yes, but the Federal Register indicates, and of course it's in, it's codified in 49 U.S.C. 504 subsection F, that I have got civil immunity. So I've got a defense that this accident report, the RDR determination, and, and you can show the judge right there in the copy of the Federal Register date July 27, 2017, that no part of this report or any um, operation should be admitted into evidence or used in this civil proceeding for damages. Seems like a pr pretty compelling argument. And further, that 
determinations are not a measure of fault, right? And right out of the, you can argue this right to your judge. They're not appropriate for use by private parties in civil litigation. They don't establish fault like we talked about. We're, we're dealing with completely different standards, compelling evidence versus the standard of care that's asserted in the state or federal court litigation that may be presently presiding and doesn't establish fault or negligence by any party or by any person's knowledge of the crash. But. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, that may be true. Um, and further, Ian say, and I have potential privileges that could be associated with the uh, with the product or the information that's being submitted. So, two things here. All right, here's a quick little uh, legal lesson you probably all know for the, for the day, but you've got two potential privileges uh, for information that shouldn't be submitted in the courtroom. One is the work product doctrine, something prepared in anticipation of litigation, and obviously the other is the attorney-client privilege. So if you're submitting an RDR and your attorney sends you a letter and outlines, well, here's my, my evaluation of the case and why I don't think uh, your negligence, but here's the potential exposure for why you might be. Obviously, you don't want to submit that information into an RDR. I know that seems kind of uh, ridiculous, but um, I, I say it for a reason because if you submit any information and you disclose it to a third party, you lose that attorney client privilege. And the work product doctrine is another product where you have certain privileges that have documentation prepared in anticipation of litigation for internal control purposes only. Here then, something you may have developed and you think, oh, well, that is a mitigating circumstance and should show the federal government why this crash should be taken off or, uh, or considered in the determination program. Now you've revealed that work product doctrine and the plaintiff's lawyers have um, free access to that. So, Here's a case, um, fairly recent case in 2017, just talking about the work product doctrine. Um, so here the plaintiff sought the production of preventable versus non-preventable crash determinations. And these were uh, documents that UPS Ground had prepared following the accident issue in the case. And the work product doctrine um, was used uh, successfully to demonstrate um, that the information that was submitted basically in these internal documents that had been prepared for anticipation of litigation. And there, the, the information, of course, had not been disclosed um, previously, and the party seeking the work product production document had to establish the materials were generated in anticipation of litigation. Uh, by presenting evidence that the type of accident issue regularly results in litigation, and further that the party's policy was to generate materials to evaluate the legal risks associated with that particular accident. So you would have very similar information on that if we go back and look at that slide of information that you must submit compelling evidence, right? So, for example, Finding that an accident report was entitled to work product protection because the party's policy was to investigate all claims of passenger injuries in anticipation of litigation. So even though you may have these documents for internal control purposes or prepared in anticipation of litigation to show that there was no basis for liability, if you disclose this information, you're compromising the privileges which or potential privileges which you may have um, under the various jurisdictions um, for which a uh, negligence, wrongful death, or other civil case could arise. And the privilege is the, the lawyer, uh, uh, lawyer client uh, materials that's, that's not, that's privileged. They can't use that in court. That's what you're talking about, right, Bridget, on this? Yeah, that, that's right. So the, so you're to the, RDR filer, the, the, the person that's in charge of filing these uh, requests for data review under the Crash Preventability Demonstration Program, may not be aware that the information that they're submitting is actually subject to protection. And that is not information that should be provided to the FMCSA because by disclosing that information, they've waived their privilege or they've waived, they, they've waived the right to 
uh, confidentiality under attorney-client communications. So um, the and that goes back to understanding and having a policy in, pro, in place and training these these individuals to ensure that if the decision is made, right, in an attempt to uh, reduce potential operational costs or costs of DOT intervention to pursue this program, that we're doing so in the in a way that doesn't compromise the defense of our client or the insured in any future uh, litigation. So let's take a few uh, moments here just to talk about the agency's use of this data. So number one, and, and, and this is some misconceptions that I, I hear in the industry, no crashes are removed from SMS as a result of the demonstration program. The FMCSA will continue to use all crashes during the demonstration program. Crash preventability demonstrations made under this program will not affect the carrier safety rating or ability to operate. Determinations will will not change how the agency will make enforcement decisions. All right, right out of the federal register there. So this is an information fact finding mission on the part of the FMCSA, and that while we have and they our insured and our clients may be successful and getting a not preventable determination, um, be aware that there's limitations based on the agency's use or non-use of this data. And so here is what the final display will be of the determination. If it's not preventable, the crash will appear on the public display display with the notation that reads FMCSA reviewed the crash and determined that it was not preventable. The crash indicator based category in the motor carrying enforcement reviews the SSS will display calculations with and without the non-preventable crashes. If it's preventable, the crash will appear on the public display of SMS with the notation reads FMCSA reviewed the crash and determined that it was preventable. And then if, it, of course, it was undecided, the documentation provided with the RDR does not allow for a conclusive determination. The crash will appear on the public display of SMS with a notation that reads, FMCSA reviewed this crash and could not make a preventability determination based on the evidence provided. So what you're saying, even so, though it's it's not preventable, it's still available for public review, that they'll still be listed. Right. The other question here, right. and also just another factor, folks, on this, post-crash drug testing criteria is not modified by this. So like that fatality, even though it was caused by someone who hit your insured or the one I mentioned, the hotel room we mentioned here, that driver had to be drug tested. So that also doesn't affect the post-crash drug testing requirements either. None of this does. Yeah, so so circling back, again, we, this is from the Federal Register. Fault is not generally determined Fault is generally determined in the course of civil and criminal proceedings and results in the assignment of legal liability for the consequences of the crash. This is their disclaimer, right? A preventability determination seeks to identify the root causes for the crash and is used to prevent the same type of crash from reoccurring. A preventability determination is not a, a, is not a proceeding to assign legal liability for a crash. But what's happening in the courtroom, Tommy? Well, as you probably know, these determinations are being sought to be admitted into court and motions in limine are being filed um, and basically you know that the motion in limine is the um, the filing that uh, defense counsel uh, will make to say that we've received disclosures from plaintiff's counsels we understand they intend to introduce a determination from the FMCSA as to the, that the crash was preventable uh, your honor we seek to exclude this information uh, for the reasons um, and then highlighting the civil immunity statute and also for the reasons set forth that this is not a determination of liability by the FMCSA it lacks reliability and so on and so forth so um, What's the result? Well, um, the results are, and, and this is just a sampling of that courts are allowing these determinations in the proceedings. They also, they also will be permittable at mediation, even though the court has made this determination. It always comes up in that. That's the other part here. So they right, say, right. So, 
So, of course, if, you know, our, our audience who's participated in mediation is familiar with the mediation process, knows that any information that's shared in the uh, mediation is confidential. It's not to be used in court proceedings. It's really an, an, a safe haven for the parties to discuss information, share information that should not be used in litigation. Now, I say that. But obviously, you know, your insured, your client, and our clients need to seek with qualified counsel before they start sharing information in mediation. Right. Um, but for the courtroom purposes, the FMCSAs uh, are going to wait, not admissibility. And so the judges, who are the gatekeepers of the evidence that comes into trial, frame the the story that the the jury will hear, and so the the judges are saying, well, if you are concerned with the reliability or the assessment of uh, of this determination, then uh, defense counsel, you can you can have an expert testify as to whether or not this should be given any consideration by the jury, and it becomes now a battle of the experts. So what what's the takeaway here? Um, first is let's understand what our insurers and what our clients are doing. Um, we know, or many of them do have processes in place for filing requests for data review, and these individuals that are doing so um, need to consult number one with their uh, with qualified counsel or have the owner. Uh, or person with authority for the company be consulting with qualified counsel as the right process to follow when an RDR is submitted for a crash demonstration preventability program, RDR. Sorry, I know that was a long sentence. <laughs> but suffice to say that these individuals, before submitting an RDR, need to consider a couple things. Number one, as I mentioned, if it's an accident where we've reported the, in, the information to insurance and we've got an adjuster in, assigned. The adjuster needs to be aware that we're going to be filing a request for data review and the information that we're going to submit in the request for data review and say we want to ensure that what we're submitting is not in any way going to prejudice the insurance company and certainly is not going to prejudice us when we submit this information. Understanding, of course, that at this point in time, the accident just happened. We haven't been notified that any lawyers have been retained to represent the interests of the witnesses or of the, the passengers in the vehicle. But that at some point down the road, before the statute of limitations expires, we may be getting information, we may be getting demands, and knowing that this information that I'm about to submit to the FMCSA portal is going to be uh, potentially used against us. So that's the pre-suit consideration is before you file that RDR, consult with your counsel. And one of the things you know something we've talked about is a lot of companies that engage individual personal or, or outside corporate counsel to help guide through them through this process. Um, that's one option or to reach out to the insurance company through their adjuster through the defense counsel to advise them and communicate what they're doing. And then for post lawsuit considerations, the same the same key issue is communicate with your defense counsel that you intend to file an RDR determination and that here is the information that I intend to submit. And I want to ensure that whatever statement my driver is submitting or whatever representation that I'm making when I submit this filing is not going to come back to harm us in litigation. So the key is communication. Communicate with the people that are involved in managing and protecting the, the your client, your insured, to ensure that whatever actions are taken through this crash the demonstration prevented liability program does not come back to hurt them. Well, Bridget, that was a lot of information. I guess the bottom line is the insurance might see more into it, our motor carriers, than what it might benefit in the long run here, realizing the cost of doing all this. It is a good step for the FMCA to, to make, 
But as we all know, a lot of things happen at a crash site that you don't determine uh, the facts of it until later. And that's the problem we have here. But I know what the government's doing, I think you agree with me, is they're addressing the American Trucking Association, the Truckload Carriers Association, challenging and odd of challenging this information about preventability or not. And this is the government answer to possibly uh, pacify those organizations. Now, I might, that's my editorial. I'm not asking you to agree with me on that or not. But uh, with that <laughs> With that said, Bridget, thank you very much for your time in this and you're here, and I hope everybody got uh, information out of this, and if they have any additional information they need, obviously they can contact you. Just remind you all that, that the next month uh, truck stop is for June the 14th at 2 p.m. We're going to talk about the effect of, of the new electronic log devices and how our insurers are, are dealing with those and those violations and things like that. For uh, we hope to see you in then, and for everything else, Bridget, thank you, and we're out of here. Thanks, Tommy. Take care.